So, as all you probably remember, I was studying weather, and um, in particular, orographic precipitation, which is the effect of mountains on the creation or modification of precipitation. Um, a big part of my project was coming up with a really good <laughs> that was pretty stressful. It took us a few months to come up with the best one. But we finally settled on CHOMPS, the Chile Orographic and Mesoscale Precipitation um, This is a picture of our mountain site and where we lived for six months this year. Our house was down in here. Um, and then this is also where the upper site was, right at our house. And then these are um, the Chian volcano system up above it. Um, work. Um, I think I pressed the wrong one. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right, so just to kind of back up and remind you all of what I'm looking at. Climatologically, we see an increase in precipitation over mountains, just over long scales of time. Um, this is a climatological map of Chile precipitation, and the purple colors are higher amounts of annual precipitation. Um, this is really interesting because um, you can really see a big change in this region here. Um, this is the region where the mountains are still pretty high, they have a pretty big effect on weather, and they get a, a fair number of storms. Um, you can see the number, the amount of precipitation decreases towards the north, which is what we would expect, and it increases towards the south. Um, down here in the south-south, the mountains are pretty small. They're, they tend to not form a continuous barrier, so you don't see quite as dramatic of an increase in precipitation. But um, right in here, where I was, near Concepcion, you do see a, a pretty dramatic gradient in annual precipitation. So my goal is to, is to look at the factors that cause that increase. Um, we understand the basic concepts behind it, which I'll run over with you guys, but this, is really, this project was aimed at looking at kind of the small scale um, processes that happen in a, in an individual storm that can create this effect. Um, all right, so to do this, I made a transect of instrumentation. Um, I had a site in Concepcion. They have an annual precipitation of, uh, this is the average, of 827 millimeters. Um, I had a site in Chian in the Central Valley. This had slightly less, 700 22 millimeters, and then the mountain site was at Las, Las Trancas, which has almost twice as much precipitation per year as Chihuahua. Um, so Concepcion receives a little bit more than Chihuahua because there's a small coastal mountain range. So storms come in off the ocean, they hit land, there's, there's a difference in like surface friction, so it slows the storm and then it's forced up over these mountains, and so they, it creates more precipitation. And then there's a little bit of a rain shadow in the Central Valley. But then they hit the Andes, and then it's forced up again. So just to remind you all, I showed this at my original presentation, um, basic precipitation theory. Um, rising air cools as it's lifted in the atmosphere. It can't hold as much moisture so water starts condensing out from the vapor phase, and that's what creates a cloud. So a cloud is really just a manifestation of rising air that's cooling, condensing out into liquid water droplets. And if it keeps rising and has con this continued motion, then those droplets will grow in size until they're big enough that the rising air can't support them, and then they start to fall out as rain or snow. Um, and snow is a very similar process, but it's a little more complex because you have things in the solid phase as well. So this is a very, you have the three phases of water in a cloud. Um, so with a mountain, you have flow coming up, it's forced over the mountain, and then it falls out over the mountain. And that's kind of basically what creates this increase in precipitation. 
Um, so for my project, I had a series of vertically pointing radars uh, at all three sites. I had precipitation gauges at all three sites so that I could collect, see exactly how much precipitation fell during individual storms. And then I had um, instruments called distrometers at two of the sites, which um, it, it, there's two laser beams pointed towards each other, and as a snow, as a snowflake or a raindrop passes through, it measures how big it is and how fast it's falling. And that can tell you a lot about the small scale processes that are happening in the clouds. So like if it's a really big raindrop, that means there's a different growth process as opposed to a smaller raindrop in the same with snowflakes. Um, okay, so this is a view from up in the mountains in the springtime. Um, the Las Trompas site, the mountain site, is kind of in this valley, but a lot of studies have shown that um, it's really just the, the average height of the topography around it that affects how much is going to fall at that site. And then the volcanoes come way up from there, and we just didn't have the ability to measure precipitation on the volcanoes, which would actually be really interesting. But this is kind of our surrogate for our mountains. <coughs> and then you can see the central valley, there's the beautiful Pollution inversion cloud layer in the central valley, um, which we're all familiar with. And then the coastal mountains you can see in the distance. Um, all right, so the first phase of the study was to set up um, a comparison between my radars. So we did that in my conception site. This is my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the three radars and we set them up next to each other for three weeks to see how well they compare because then I move them to different sites and I want to be able to do direct comparisons around them. Um, so a lot of what I did was a lot of logistics, like I had to, I had to ship all the instruments from the U.S. Um, they got stuck in customs for a while. And Will and I kind of drove around and like shuttled instruments around for a long time, made sure we found good sites. Um, so that was like the first three months of the project, was like figuring out all the logistics and getting things going. Um, so at the Concepcion site, once the comparison was done, I left one radar, and then we also had a small precipitation gauge there. Um, in Xi'an, the, at the university, they already had a a nice weather station set up. Um, this is a precipitation gauge that they had there. And then we set up the radar and the distrometer there as well. And this is the Las Trancas site. Uh, we had the radar, the distrometer, and then this is the precipitation gauge. This precipitation gauge is um, specifically for snow or rain, the other ones can only collect rain. And so that was actually a big, that was new in this region because most of the high elevation precipitation sites can only collect rain, which is kind of ridiculous because in the high elevations you get a lot of snow in the winter. And um, a lot of those, those <coughs> gauges work that they, they collect liquid water and once it reaches a certain amount, it tips over and lets it out and empties towards that amount, like a fixed amount. And this one works, I fill it with like an antifreeze solution, and as the snowflakes fall in, they melt, and it measures the difference in weight. And that's how you can tell how much precipitation there is. Um, and then this is a wind and temperature sensor. And this is our house. Okay, so I had, this is just kind of a rundown of when I had all my instruments up. Um, the distrometer, I, I had like a faulty piece, and I had to like s send it to my friend in the U.S. who was coming to visit, and she had to bring it down. Um, so the, the distrometers were a little, were not quite as um, long-lived. They started a little bit late. Um, haven't had a chance to analyze the precipitation data from Concepcion yet, I just got it. But um, 
we had a pretty bad winter. I found that we, we received 340 millimeters of precip in Qian, which is about half of the average, and 773 millimeters in Las Trancas, which is also about half the average. Um, but you can see that the difference between Las Trancas and Qian stayed about the same. All right, so the next phase, this phase of my project was really more about data collection, doing all the logistics, setting up the instruments. Um, during the winter, I had to make sure they were all working. So I had them all connected to the internet so that I could like log in remotely and see that they were all working and um, like fix any crises whenever they happened. Um, I had a website going up where I plotted the data and um, but I haven't done a lot of analysis yet, so that's the next phase of this. Um, so I just wanted to present to you one storm that I thought was interesting, kind of show you some of the data that I got, some of the questions that um, I have and the, the hypothesis that I have for the next stage of my analysis. Um, so this is a, a graph of hourly precipitation rate um, versus the date. This was one of our biggest storms in Las Trancas between the 10th of July through the 15th of July. Um, and the red trace is precipitation at the mountain site, and the blue trace is precipitation in the valley site at Chion. Um, and you can see that they don't line up exactly. There's a little bit of a lag, so that's part of it. But you can also see the red, there's these big um, areas where there's a lot of precip on the mountain site and not much at the valley site. So I'm really interested in what creates these long periods of extended precipitation at the mountain site. Um, this graph <laughs> looks kind of weird, but it's, it's a graph of the orographic ratio. So it's the, the precipitation at the mountain site divided by the precipitation at the valley site. So if they're equal, it'll be one. If you get four times more at the mountain site, it'll be four. Um, and I, I flipped it so that if the valley site got more, it was the same number, but negative. Um, and then if it goes all the way up to 10, it means that it wasn't um, raining at the valley site at all. So just like a quick look at this shows you that there were tons of periods where the valley site wasn't getting anything at all. Um, and then a lot of periods where the mountain site was just getting more, um, on the order of two to five times more. And then there were a few times when the valley site got more, but they were much less common. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of this can be explained by thinking about a storm um, over the ocean has different sectors, so you'll have, often you'll get like, um, the, you get the movement of warm air into a region ahead of a storm. Um, sometimes you'll get rain associated with that. And then you often get what's called a cold front, so like a surge of cold air. Sometimes it's a really dramatic change. Sometimes it's often near the ocean, it's not so dramatic. Um, and then you get the, the influx of cold air behind it. So in, in meteorology terms, that, that can really affect the kinds of precipitation that you see and the strength of it. Um, and I don't want to like go into gory details about this, but um, I wanted to show some satellite images because I think they're pretty cool, different storm sectors during this time. So this is in the, the prefrontal stage. So this is warm air coming in. And you have a pretty constant cloud cover over all of the sites. And in this time, both sites are getting precip. The valley's even getting a little bit more. Um, and then just a few hours later, that shield's kind of shifted over. So you see, you see the constant shield of precipitation over here. This is the, the mountain site. And then over here, you're starting to see kind of more scattered clouds. Um, and that these scattered clouds are associated with the cold air behind. It, it's what we call more unstable. So it creates more like, um, you can 
convection like you might see in a summer thunderstorm where you have like an isolated cloud that's really strong and then blue sky around it. And that's what that looks like from above. Um, and this is just a zoom in on that so that you can see all the little clouds um, popping up there. Um, and if you look closely, this is a really interesting thing. You see that they're in bands aligned along the direction of the wind. And they're, they're forming along the coastline. So there's, there's nothing over the ocean. But it's moist and it's unstable. And when it hits the coast, it gets strong enough that it generates a cloud and precipitation. And it organizes in these bands. And that's not super well um, understood how, exactly how that happens. Um, and one thing I want you to notice in here is that you're starting to see more thicker cloud cover over the mountains. So often you'll see that pretty scattered over the valley and the coastal mountains, but then pretty, still pretty continuous over the mountains. <coughs> This is later in the period. This is another post frontal, so cold air, unstable. And you really see that pronounced. You see the, the bands of convection over the valley and the coastal mountains. And then over the Andes, it's really thick. So it's, it's still precipitating pretty strongly over the mountains in this picture. Uh, you can see it's in this time period. But over Chian, it just happened to not be under one of those bands, so it didn't get any. So um, it really depends on where those bands set up and where those individual storms come across. Um, so this is what that time period looks like in radar. Uh, this is radar reflectivity. So the stronger values mean bigger precipitation particles, stronger rain. Um, <clears throat> the upper thing is at the is in the valley, and the lower one is at the mountain site. This strong change is um, snowflakes turning into rain. Rain has a higher reflectivity, so you can actually see exactly where the zero degree isothermal is in the radar. Um, and you can see that same pattern in the radar. So over the valley, you have these shorter periods of intense precipitation that more or less line up with the mountain site. But the mountain site has all these smaller, shallower periods and these shallower periods are the times during those, those periods of cold infection when you have more clouds over the mountains than over the valley. It's kind of sporadic um, and shallower and often weaker. So this is a picture from our house during that time period. So it was snowing up there. Um, this is at 8.40 in the morning, local time. And then um, this is what that looked like, so that was right around in here. And then I went down to the valley that day, and these are these convective clouds. So you can see it looks just like a summer thunderstorm. Um, and there, it's just like these bands growing up. And over me, it was basically blue sky at that time. Um, and that's, that's what's like right around in here in the afternoon but it was still precipitating at the moment. Okay, so my hypothesis going forward is that these periods um, where you have sporadic convection over the, the mountains and pretty consistent, shallower, maybe weaker, but more persistent uh, precipitation over the mountains really add to this um, gradient and precipitation that we see. And um, that's, a, that's a theory that's been thrown out in the literature, but it hasn't been uh, investigated in a lot of detail. So this, um, I think that this data set can really add to that, um, to show using the radar data especially what exactly is happening. And um, as I go forward, I want to, sorry, you have to like access your Spanish and your English mind right now. Um, <laughs> Um, as I go forward, I want to um, quantitatively analyze my radar data set, especially um, to, to look at how high the, the 
we call them the echo tops are, so like the depth of the precipitating cloud in different sectors of the storm. So that'll involve looking at the large scale, dividing it into like, oh, this is prefrontal, this is postfrontal periods. Um, actually, um, looking at how the, the, the change, and you can see the velocity of like how fast the particles are moving down with the radar. So looking at that, you can look at a lot of statistical things like how often does it change? What's the variance? Often you find in these convective periods, it changes a lot from like really strong upward to really strong downward. Um, and then it's just like a, a normal, um, kind of more consistent large scale storm section. Um, it's, it's more consistent, it's just like slowly falling. We call that stratiform rain. So you can use that to classify it into different sectors. Um, I want to look at how strong the reflectivity values are over the valley and the mountain. Um, so like how hard it's raining um, and things like that. Um, and then using those, those different sectors and the, the statistical analysis of the radar data, I can get an idea of what's really adding to this gradient precipitation, like um, really like quantitatively divided out, although it Pretty sure this is what it is. Um, all right, so that's what I have to do moving forward. Um, there's a lot of people I need to thank. I need to put it on the list, but my beautiful assistant <laughs> <laughs> helped me through a lot of this. Um, Rene Garot at the Universidad de Chile was my advisor, and he was super helpful. Um, a couple others at the Universidad de Chile really helped me with instruments and settling my logistics. And then Diego Salazar at the Universidad de Concepcion in Chilean um, hosted my instrumentation, he was super helpful, as well as Aldo Montesinos at the Universidad de Concepcion in Concepcion. Um, and then I got two additional grants to fund my shipping of the instrumentation, <laughs> which is not cheap. Um, so I'd like to I didn't quite catch what like the reflectivity came from. So the reflect so a radar it's a it's a certain electromagnetic wave. This is just like a radio wave. That's, that's what it comes from. And the radar sends it out towards the cloud and it gets bounced back by the, the particles in the in the cloud. The, they have to in this wavelength they have to be big enough to be precipitating. So rain or snow waves. And it gets bounced back and it it looks at the change in the wavelength um, to, to basically measure how big the particles are. So bigger particles you can infer mean stronger precipitation. And then I'm interested in kind of like, in so, so the cloud forms and like I'm thinking of like little, like you see like dew on like a table in early in the morning, right? And like the big droplets are like eating up the little ones. Yeah. Is that kind of how like the, the cloud forms, like does the moisture kind of get pulled along with it, like the from the back? And could that like be a factor in kind of how you get like that scattered clouds at the, the back of the system? I'm not quite following what you mean by pulled along from the back. Or, like when, so at the start of like the, the wave front, you, you get the start of cloud formation as it's coming onto land. And does that kind of like precipitate a kind of chain reaction? Uh, behind it, and um, the, the moisture. It, not not necessarily. I think that the formation of the particles itself won't cause back building like that. But back building is actually a term in like thunderstorms, uh, like severe thunderstorms. <laughs> um, but it has more to do with like where the warm and the cold air is, and um, where there's strong upward motion. Upward motion is everything. Like that's that's what you, that's like that's like it about meteorology. It's, like upward, it's all about upward motion, you know. Um, so it, it can back build, but it's not it's not a feedback from the actual formation of the precipitation. 